Last week, driving from Malaysia to Thailand left me stranded. They don't make cars like they used to. And this week? Well, take a look. Oh, are you kidding me? Oh, no! Oh. I'm on a green mission from Singapore to an orphanage in Cambodia. They have no reliable energy supply, but I found a machine that can make a huge difference to their lives. It converts used cooking oil to biofuel. And to prove it can work, I'm going to power my car with biofuel and drive over 2,000 kilometers to Cambodia, converting oil along the way. I won't just be buying dinner. I'm going to be asking for the oil it was cooked in to fill my tank. Since I arrived in Malaysia in my biofuel mobile, I've explored everything from palm oil cultivation to extracting methane from pig manure. Collecting used cooking oil to convert to biodiesel for my car hasn't been easy, but I stuck at it and got some eventually. But right now, on my way to Thailand, I've hit my biggest hiccup yet. I pulled over to talk on my phone and have spent two hours trying to start my car up again. My phone's dead and understandably in the dark of the night, no one's stopping to help me. Hello, I am from England. Would you help me, sir? Hey, hey, someone's stopping. Oh. Do you have a jack? Um, I'd like to start again. Yeah, it's a bit loose. Why don't you try it now? Dude, thank you so much. No you saved me a night out on the highway by myself. No thank you. All right. Thanks no. a lot. Bye. Bye. Apparently just a loose cable. Phew, what a relief. And what a guy. Thailand, here I come. With more than a thousand kilometers still to go through Thailand to Cambodia, I'm not keen to risk another breakdown. I've taken the car in for a service and swapped it for another one. So I got my new wheels for my Thailand adventure, and it's time for the christening. Right up until the 1960s, Thailand relied heavily on firewood and wood charcoal as its major sources of fuel. This overuse and more recent factors such as large-scale farming and timber trading have severely depleted Thailand's huge rainforests. When naturally occurring forests are cut down, we lose a lot of resources. And we greatly increase the likelihood of soil erosion, flooding and global warming. Forests play a major role in absorbing the CO2 emissions from the 12,000 million tons of fuel we burn annually, believed to be causing global warming. I'm on my way to see for myself one of these great gifts of nature, Khao Sok National Park, the largest area of virgin rainforest left in southern Thailand. It's older and more diverse than the Amazon rainforest. Wow, I'm finally here at the Ao Jungle House, which is an eco-resort right in the middle of the Khao Suk Rainforest. Today, tourism plays an important educational role in preserving rainforests like these. This resort is the brainchild of trailblazer Dick Sandler. He built his first eco-resort on the infamous River Kwai in 1972, before the word eco-resort even existed. To me, it's very simple. Ecotourism is simply an activity or a resort that improves rather than detracts from the natural environment. So how do you improve the local environment here? Well, I think part of that is very low density, which is my main principle in developing. You know, we absolutely cut down no trees. And as you'll see, the houses are spaced very far apart so that the guests get the feeling that they're almost alone in nature. You can see how respect for nature is incorporated into the business. For example, the tree houses are built using locally grown materials, so it doesn't take much, if any, fuel to get it here. The resort also employs locals and helps local businesses, and as a result, they see value in preserving the forest. We really emphasize giving an, an experience of nature to our guests. We hope that they 
maybe gain a respect for nature, pick up from us the respect we have for nature, and in their future choices of places to have a holiday, uh, pick places that, that are trying to, to conserve the environment. With growing populations and growing economies, rainforests are under constant threat from deforestation. By converting Khao Sok into a national park, the Thai government has ensured its survival. You get elephants here. Oh, absolutely. During the 60s and 70s, Khao Sok's thick jungle was the perfect hideout for communist insurgents. Terrified of the rebels, the loggers stayed well away, and the forest and all its inhabitants were left in peace. I like to think I get onto nature much, and I love nature, but one thing I really hate are bloodsuckers. <laughs> they come from everywhere, every angle. Let's just get out of here. You know, getting up How is do the I get e down? Getting up is the easy part. Uh, uh, hey. <laughs> Kids, do not attempt this at home. All right. Up until the 1960s, local forests supplied almost all of Thailand's energy. Now, the majority is imported making its population of 65 million people vulnerable to both supply and price fluctuations. By 2020, Thailand hopes to replace 20% with renewable energy from locally produced biofuels, solar, wind and hydro energy. Hi. Hi. My name is Yat. Yeah. I hear you're taking me to the dam. Yes. Okay, are uh, you ready to go to the lake? Yes, very ready. Okay, let's jump. I'm going to jump on the back. Let's hop on board. So yeah, this is the dam. Yes. It's a type of dam. Oh, uh, Lake. Gates in the dam can be opened, sending the water downhill through pipes. The moving water turns turbines that are attached to massive generators underground. There's nothing too ugly about this energy source. Right now, the sun's beating down on the water and it is an out of this world experience. You have these incredible mountains, these limestone, hills behind us in the distance. It couldn't get more serene and beautiful than this. In 1982, entire villages in the area were flooded to create the lake. You can still see the remnants of the tree trunks sticking out of the water. We are in as deep as you can get into the wilderness. The people who lived here were compensated and relocated. As a tourist destination, Chao Lan Lake has created a new source of income for them. So here we have a really back to basics kind of resort. And um, it's good to see that they're actually recycling their waste. And they obviously know that spoiling the water is no good for the environment and for uh, future tourists. On the one hand, the lake creates clean, renewable energy. On the other, it meant the destruction of part of the rainforest. But from what I can see, Chao Lian Lake has become a hotspot for educating tourists, and this may be the key to the longevity of the remaining rainforest. It's tough to have to leave the beauty of the rainforest behind to enter Bangkok, Thailand's capital of more than 8 million people. I've got an appointment with a member of parliament to find out more about Thailand's conservation efforts. Traffic is a major headache for this city. They even have transport police who are trained to deliver babies. And I've got a bit of a transport problem myself. Oh no. I got clamped. I can't believe it. Oh God. I could be waiting here for hours to get this clam removed. So I need to find an alternative means of transport to get around the city. Whoa. So I got me some new wheels. It's an electric powered moped, which I can also pedal with to recharge the batteries. It ain't pretty, but it sure is green. Woohoo! 
Bangkok's economic boom during the 80s brought huge increases in vehicle ownership, and air pollution reached seriously worrying levels in the 1990s. But government measures have actually halved the pollution level over the past 15 years. Hopefully, I won't be late for my meeting with the PM. Pedal power! The Thai government has a vision for a greener Thailand. In Bangkok, I see a lot of waste getting thrown into the rivers. We try to educate the people that waste is also money. And we start to see a lot of people recycling and start to uh, set up factory that would accept waste from all of this. You know, the plastic bottles is money. The good news is that we see the private sector start to do that as a business. And that is the way that is more sustainable than government imposing it. To reduce air pollution, the government convinced oil companies and car manufacturers to improve their fuel and emission standards. They've also structured taxes to make unleaded fuel and biofuels cheaper. Personally, what makes you such an advocate for green policies? It's the right thing to do. We provide more jobs for the people. We have less waste as a country. So why not? MP Kiat points me towards what's known as the green lung of Bangkok. Benjamin, an eco-hotel consultant, has kindly offered to be my guide on the small island of Pra Pradeng. Yes, so we are arriving here at the Bangkok Tree House. Yes, be oh. careful. It's Whoa. A the Bangkok Tree House is an eco-resort that has successfully incorporated green policies that save money and lessen their carbon footprint. The very wood we walk on right now has been reclaimed from uh, all Thai houses. I noticed as we came over on the boat, there were some builders who threw uh, a whole bunch of plastic bottles into the water. We have so much work to do in raising awareness among Thai people. It seems that they totally disconnected their action from the impact it's going to have on, on their own livelihood. Discarded juice cartons were used to insulate the walls. In each of those walls, uh, they used plastic from Tetra Pak, the bricks. They used it to, uh, to insulate as well and reduce the amount of energy needed to cool the unit down. The highlight of this hotel is how they managed to make use of waste and give a second life to, to something that would have ended up in the bin. And Bangkok Treehouse couldn't call itself an eco-resort without a renewable energy supply. So they have both um, solar panels and wind wow. turbines. Um, it's quite something. Yes, it is. And it generates enough energy to make the kitchen and the restaurant to run, as well as all the external lights. And this is used to heat the water, which will then be used for the guest rooms. You see the most industrialized part of Bangkok with all the container ships, and then just beyond that, the central business district. The contrast is quite unique. I'm very impressed by the ingenuity here, but I need to head back to the city to get refueled. I'm running low on biofuel for my car, so I need to find some waste cooking oil and convert it for tomorrow's journey. I'm here in Khao San Road, the center of the backpacking universe in Thailand. It's a one kilometer strip full of bars, massage parlors and hawker stands. Perfect to go find some cooking oil. Do you have any waste cooking oil? You don't have any. Do you have any waste oil from cooking? Waste cooking oil. No, I don't have. Do you have any waste oil? No, not pad thai. I hear it, do you hear it? Yeah, I hear the fry. Can I take this? This what? Not, not oil, oh. oil and water. Oil and water, okay. Yeah. Ah, you don't just have the oil? No. Oh, ah, okay. Hi, excuse me. I need to get some waste oil, use cooking oil. <laughs> okay, all right, so thank you very much. I am exhausted. Mmm, liquid gold. I got my oil. Finally, so it's time for me to go back, get this converted, fill my tank. 
Amazingly, about 80% of this used cooking oil will be converted straight into biodiesel, which I can then use to fill my car. So this is Mike. Mike lent me the electric moped. Thank you very much, Mike. No problem, my pleasure. And Mike, who has a background in engineering, is curious to see how I make it. So into the converter goes my waste cooking oil. I need to thin the oil by separating and removing the glycerin content. Adding this catalyst will do that, and a dash of methanol to make the fuel burn better. So give that 99 minutes, and at the other end we'll get biodiesel. Why don't we go grab a beer? Sounds good. Okay. I've now paid my parking fine, and the wheel clamp has thankfully been removed by the Bangkok police. I'm free to go. As I make my way to the Cambodian border on my biofueled adventure, I hope to see more of Thailand's renewable energy projects. In 1983, Thailand built its first power turbine to research wind energy. Now it plans to be the hub of wind power in Asia by 2022. The construction of several large-scale wind farms is in progress, including the largest wind farm in Southeast Asia. But Mike's told me about a small wind farm that's been operational for many years on Lan Island, an island of just 2,000 people off the coast of Pattaya. It's just a couple of hours away and not far off my route to Cambodia. Mike studied wind turbine technology during his uni years. Thailand's islands may be beautiful, but they face challenges in getting power. Lan Island was only connected to the national grid very recently. Before this, it generated its own power at a small diesel-fired plant, but this often failed and it was really noisy. So they turned to solar and wind power to solve their problem. Back in 2006, the island still relied on nothing but diesel fuel generators, which burned a lot of fuel and that's extremely wasteful. Um, so in 2006, 2007, they erected these wind turbines over there and those wind turbines actually save 200 liters of diesel fuel every day. The turbines aren't actually running today. Maybe a local can tell us why. Okay, come back up. What did you say? <laughs> the news isn't good. Apparently, since they've attached the cable, they shut down the wind turbines. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe let's go for a walk. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> the reason they aren't running it now is because this island's pretty close to the coast, so they've actually built a cable along it underwater to reach the island from the mainland. Now, they did run the turbines for five years, and it was working then, but now that it's become such a popular tourist attraction, they're opening up resorts and hotels, and now they need a bit more power. Wind energy is 100% renewable, and it's clean. But on a day like today, would you be getting much yield from these solar panels or even the wind turbines? Well, we picked a pretty bad day to come look at this because there's, there's no wind right now and you can see it's, it's overclouded. But when this happens, there's actually there's, there's, there's some ways of storing energy um, when they aren't running. When, when the turbines are running or when the, when the solar panels are running, um, if you aren't using all the power that's coming out of them. The, the excess power can be sent to a pump, which will pump water uphill and store it in a big tank, so that on a day like today, where you don't have any sun, you don't have any wind, they can let the water out of the tank and it comes down and it spins a generator. So it's like you're storing it in a giant water battery. Still, I want to get a closer look at those wind turbines. Jumping on the tourism bandwagon, the taxi service here is run by locals who used to be fishermen. Our tuk-tuk driver remembers the old days of the diesel generators. So he's telling me he was actually, he's lived on this island for 30 years. And he said they were really loud and noisy and wasteful and he couldn't even sleep at night because they were on until 12 at night. Since the recent connection to the national grid via an eight kilometer long undersea cable, getting power isn't an issue on Koh Lan Island. The wind turbines are now just a tourist attraction. Bit of a shame, really. 
ครับโอเคอย่างเกาะเกาะไผ่เกาะเล็กอะไรทั้งนู้นอ่ะโอเคดี He was saying he sees people come up here to to look at them all the time and a lot of people come to the island just to see the wind turbines well like like us yeah Mike's kindly invited me to the Loi k r a t o n g celebrations, Thailand's very own festival of lights, where, as the full moon begins to hover in the night sky, people all across the country take their lotus-shaped, candle-lit vessels to the nearest beach and release them. The belief is that if the k r a t o n g floats away from you, the coming year will bring good fortune. If it floats back towards the shore, then your luck may not be so good. For a country that imports the massive majority of its energy needs, Thailand is definitely making steps in the right direction. Local projects like large solar farms, wind farms, and hydroelectricity will hopefully mean that Thailand can meet its growing energy needs well into the future, without it costing the earth. Okay, there she goes, down into the river. Way to end my Thailand adventure. After my long journey from Singapore through Malaysia and Thailand, the first thing that strikes me here in Cambodia are the roadside stalls, which sell petrol in recycled bottles to motorcyclists. More than 80%, or around one and a half million, of the vehicles in Cambodia are motorbikes, and many people simply can't afford fuel from regular gas stations. Allegedly, it's been mostly smuggled across the border from Thailand and Vietnam, where fuel is subsidized and prices are lower. There's so much to see in Cambodia before I end my trip at the orphanage in Siem Reap. I'm hoping to learn as much as I can before I get there, so I can help them reduce their energy costs. First up. A slight detour to beautiful Battam Bang. It's the former capital and home to some of the best-preserved French colonial architecture in the country. It's a bit of a tourist town these days, which brings me to why I'm stopping here. How can someone possibly run a successful hotel business in a country where power cuts are so common? According to UN reports, only one out of every five Cambodians has access to electricity. And the large majority of those that do live in the capital, Phnom Penh. Electricity is also expensive and unreliable. Blackouts happen often, making diesel generators a necessity. In fact, at least 95% of Cambodia's energy supply comes from imported fossil fuel. A tenuous situation for a poor country to be in. My biofuel converter could come in handy here. So I've been told that this is one of the hottest places to stay right now. Oh, c a r i b e v e r It sounds very French. I think it is French. This eco hotel boasts responsible waste management, locally sourced products, and my particular favorite, a naturally filtered swimming pool. Energy-saving technology has considerably reduced this hotel's reliance on the national grid. Its French owner, Mathieu Damperon, explains the super low-cost air cooling system to me. This is a concept come from Canada. You can use it to have uh, hot air in your house or cool air. It's up to you. Hot air or hot hair? Hot hair. <laughs> <laughs> This is the secret. It's very small. It's um, a fan, just a small fan, only 12 watt per hour. It's very easy to use. We will bring the hair from the top, go underground, and after arrive in your bungalows. This sucks the hot air yeah. down, pumps it somehow into yeah. the bungalow, and it yeah. gets two to three degrees cooler once exactly. it's inside. But I don't hear a pump. Yeah, we just just need a fan, okay. small fan. 
down here, right. and one into your room. So come on. Okay. A typical small fan will use less than 50 watts per hour of energy. An air conditioning unit will use at least 1,000 watts per hour. Mature is making a huge saving. And this is a pipe arrived in your room. You have just another one fan here, and the fresh air arrived from down. So it doesn't look very glamorous, but you can see how simple technology really reduces the energy consumption of the place. Because last night, I didn't turn on my aircon, and it was very cool. So it's really very yeah. effective. And obviously, the French like fresh air for their fresh hair. <laughs> <laughs> and here's that chemical-free pool, which, like the air cooling system, makes optimal use of natural resources. We use the plant for the water filtration. It's a natural pool. This concept comes from Germany. Uh, this is the first in Cambodia. There's no chemical product inside. Do you have to have special plants, or is this just a common kind of plant you find locally? We use the plant from Cambodia. You can build this kind of pool all over the world. You have just to find the plant you can find in the natural ponds around in the nature. And if the water is clear, it means these plants have capacity for filtration. After that, you bring the plant here. You have the first, the heart of the pool is here. Come down. Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. There's, There's a little adventure. secret door. Down the hatch. Allez-y. La resistance, huh? <laughs> this is really uh, cute. They have the pump and the filter. That's it. Yeah. And with that, we send the water in the bungalows, in my home, in the pool. And the water comes from two pounds I have each side of the land. This is the water from the rain. We recycle the water from the rain. We don't use the water from the town because there's too much chemical product inside. All the hotel's water comes from these natural ponds. The collected water is even used for showering and cooking. So the water oh, wow. we use comes from this pond. Yes, we have two lexes. One on the other side and this one. Are they lotus? Flowers? Yes, lotus flower. It means the water is pure. So it looks a bit green, but they call it sweet water. So I'm going to give it a go and uh, see just how clean it is. The water tastes amazing, like no chemicals, nothing. <sighs> Welcome to the green life. Mature has set up a visit to a local farm for me. I'm told just a short walk through the town is a train that will take me to it. And the train turned out to be more fun than I ever expected. Hey! Hello, stop! This is the legendary bamboo train. These railway tracks were built by the French in the 1920s for steam trains that transported bananas and coffee. Hi, can I get on? Okay. The bamboo trains came about after the Khmer Rouge fell. Made out of old tank parts and recycled motors for motorbikes, rice harvesters and tractors. It's incredible how he's put together this two-stroke engine, managed to get this belt wrapped up to the wheels. It's a cheap, fuel-efficient way for locals and tourists to get from town to town. And adrenaline rushes come for free. Oh, shit. Fucking hell, what happened? We just, we just hit an anthill on the side, so we nearly went flying onto the actual tracks. My heart's beating a little fast, and I'm looking for the seatbelt, but the driver soon got us up and running. Literally. Let's get going! Train hopping! <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> We're back on track! This is certainly a more efficient way to get to the farm than driving my car. It's just 10 kilometers by train, but would have been 25 kilometers by road. 
Okay, so it took an hour and a half more, but I'm just thinking of the fuel I saved and the fun I've had. Oh, we're here. Okay. Okuntrang. Thank you very much. It ain't the Orient Express exactly, but if you want a unique way to see the Cambodian countryside, this is it. My two and a half thousand kilometer road trip to Cambodia on biofuel seems less extraordinary now that I realize the complex energy challenges that most Cambodians face every day. To really understand day-to-day -day living here in Cambodia, I'm on my way to visit a rice farming community. Rice is the country's main crop, making up almost 85% of the cultivated land. Rural areas are hardest struck. Less than 30% of Cambodia is electrified, one of the lowest rates in Southeast Asia. Hi, hi Pong. Yeah, how are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, this is my uh, owner's yeah. house, my uncle. Hello. Stefan. For the other 70% of the country, electricity can only come from burning expensive diesel. Low-cost, renewable resources undoubtedly have huge potential to make a big difference to the quality of life here. Many people, they have not enough money. Mm. They cannot buy the power. Right. So they can't use any more power from uh, their bottom Right. So at any time, but at night time, they have, they need to have, they have to buy the candle or they make the lamp from the, from the gas. They put in the can and they make the flame. So, yeah, like so the people around this area are still quite poor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. So here we go. Ooh. Ah. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. As we head out to the rice fields on the ox-powered cart, I can't help thinking how much imported energy per year could be saved by having a rice husk bioenergy plant in Cambodia. Rice husk can be used for making biogas for electricity generation and bioethanol to supplement or replace petrol. It takes less than two kilograms of husk to produce one kilowatt per hour of electricity. Around 40 rice mills in Cambodia do already power their facility with their own biogas. Okay, yeah. This is a uh, rice paddy. And now the people just to make the harvest, you know. Most of them, they make only one, one time a year, mm -hmm. especially on the uh, rainy time, because you got the, the, the water from the, from the sky, because yeah. we we'll get our rain water for irrigation rice field. But also right now, the government, they start to make the small canal, yet through the, in the rice field, so the people, they can pump in the water to growing, uh, to, to growing and to irrigation on the uh, rice field also. More rice production. Yeah, and seeing that uh, they can do two times a year, in the rainy season and in the dry season. Look at that. Hey. Hard day's work. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah, OK. So by channeling rain from the monsoons through a man-made canal system, the farmers will be able to irrigate their crops in the dry season, almost doubling production. Fantastic! Nature and commerce working hand in hand. And on my way back to the hotel, I spot some of the canal construction that's already underway. It's time for me to pack my bags and leave Battenbang, but I need more fuel. Do you have any waste cooking oil? I have no trouble getting used cooking oil at this eco-friendly hotel. And it may well be my last collection before I hand over the converter to the orphanage in Siem Reap in a couple of days. Oh, you're queen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You made it so easy for me. So that was the easiest it's ever been, getting some waste oil. But I've got it, and it's time to make some biodiesel. Into the converter goes my waste cooking oil. I set the unit to heat the oil to 70 degrees. Once it's up to temperature, I add chemicals to refine the oil. And the hardest bit? Well, I have to wait two hours for the chemical processes to work their magic. Inside the tank, the catalyst I added is separating the glycerine content, effectively thinning my fuel to make it usable in my engine. 
voila, biodiesel. I'm on the last leg of my journey to Siem Reap now. But along the way, I'm going to stop by one of Cambodia's most impressive natural features, Tonle Sap Lake, where the Chonkanese community rely totally on the lake for their food, water, and housing. Much of the community lives in floating houses and have no choice other than to live here. They can't afford land. I seek out the commune chief, who takes me to see some other housing on stilts on the shores of the lake. Hello. So, oh, we're going over there, okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> so Pingna was just telling me how in the wet season, this lake is entirely covered. But when we go into the dry season like we are now, they actually use it to plant rice. And you can see how they've built up the rice paddies and created these small little ponds for their own subsistence farming. Very clever. Although they live on the largest lake in Southeast Asia, ironically, the community is short of safe drinking water. What kind of issues did the community here face? So the Chongnese now have access to clean water and fewer people get sick, but the lake itself is still heavily polluted. It is the only place they can put their waste. There's plastic everywhere. When they have tried to put rubbish by the side of the road, it starts to stink because no one comes to collect it. To see the situation for myself, I need to travel across the lake to the floating houses. This lake feeds millions of people. Swells from the Mekong River flood the plains during the monsoon season, providing the breeding ground for Tonle Sap's bountiful supply of fish. More than three quarters of Cambodia's freshwater fish catch comes from here, and it's estimated to feed not just the lake's locals, but more than three million people. We're passing by the floating houses on Tong Le Sap Lake. It's quite a spectacle to see. You can see right into the houses. You can see the babies jumping into the water. You can see people cleaning themselves. You can see the dogs. It's fascinating. Tonle Sap is also home to many ethnic Vietnamese who've emigrated to Cambodia over the last 50 to 100 years. With precious few resources themselves, this is not always to the liking of the native Cambodians. So I'm going to go and visit one of the families here on their floating houses and get an idea of how they live. Hello, can I come in? Yeah, come here. Quite small in here. This must be the storage room with all their fish nets and the drying room. And then what's through here? Oh right, this is well this must be the kitchen with all their pans. I don't see any stoves or anything. I wonder what they cook with. And then down here, ah, there's the stove. They use wood. And a bit of a washing area. I don't see any toilets anywhere. I wonder what they do when it comes to that. Oh, I see. These people have no source of sanitary disposal and their waste, sewage and engine oil all go into the lake. The water that they drink and fish from and cook in. The owner knows about the water supply station where they can buy clean water, but says it's pretty far away. I decide to pay a visit. So this is where the local people come 
and buy the fresh or filtered water as opposed to drinking the river water, which is contaminated. The filtration station was provided by an NGO. This system has no impact on the environment because it's powered by solar energy. So, as I understand it, they suck in the water here, comes in through this chlorine mixer, and that gets rid of all that bacteria in the water. And it comes through here, and some sort of electrolysis is going on, which is powered by a solar panel on the roof. That then cleans up the water even further, which then goes out to the tanks over there, where the water is ready to be collected and drunk. So this is where you pump the clean water for yeah, the, the clean locals? Yeah, the clean water you can OK. Yeah. Beautifully clean. Yeah, very clean. <laughs> mm. Four hours of a bit of filtration, a bit of UV. That's what you get, huh? I've decided to buy some water to distribute to the community and help to spread the word at the same time. Hi, here's some fresh water for you. The sad reality is that when one family member is sick, the whole family suffers from loss of income. And without education, any plans for change are just that, only plans. What I've found so far is that most families think it's too far to go to the filter station to get the clean water. So I've got one more bottle of water and I'm going to go to the family that I visited before and give it to them. Okay. Hello. Hello. I don't think anyone's home. Just as we were about to leave, some of the family arrived back home. It seems so ironic that here on Asia's largest freshwater lake that we have to deliver clean filtered water. It just shows you how easy it is to ruin our most precious resource. In this country of 15 million people, only 26% are connected to electricity networks. Many Cambodians have to rely on diesel generators. The price of electricity in Cambodia is also the highest in Southeast Asia. In rural areas, electricity can cost four times as much as in the cities. I'm making one more stop before hitting Cambodia's second largest city, Siem Reap, to find out more about sustainable energy in rural areas of Cambodia. With more than three quarters of Cambodians living outside its cities, this is the real Cambodia. I don't have far to go. Just a hundred kilometers from Siem Reap is Koh Khe, an area I'm told is not connected to the national power grid. And on the journey there, I see something totally unexpected. Bumpy roads. Hey, check it out. Look, looks like someone's put a solar panel on their house. Yeah, let's go check it out. Okay. Oh, Sisudai, so Sisudai. So Is this your home? Is this your house? I saw a solar panel on the roof. Solar, sun, let's do it. Baby star, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh man. Hello, it's quite big in here. Now you can see the wire coming from the solar panel on the roof. Comes down here. Got a little transformer, it looks like. And this is their PowerPoint, do you? Is this uh, TV? <laughs> TV? Yeah. This poor farming family of four managed to purchase a second-hand wow. solar panel which powers a portable DVD player and two lights. And then this light from solar panel, does it work? Yeah. Just turn on. Ah. All right. Here's an amazing fact. The solar power that reaches the Earth in just one hour 
is more than the quantity used by the entire population of the Earth in a year. We only capture a minute 0.058% of the solar energy available to us. Even more remarkable, at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, the amount of solar energy is four times greater. If man can develop the right technology at the right price, this clean renewable energy will be of a huge benefit to the world. A former NASA engineer has designed a prototype satellite that transmits solar energy back to the power plants on Earth. Solar energy provides a ray of hope for about 1.4 billion people, a fifth of the world's population, who have no access to electricity. Before they had solar energy, this family used a car battery for their needs. <laughs> And I see they've got a water filter over there. So they obviously know about clean water and the benefits of that. They use the filter to treat water collected from the nearby pond, making it safe to drink. You can see it's quite muddy and dirty, and this purified water is much cleaner. You can see behind there is a very large banana plantation, which is how they make a living. And they've tried to funnel some of the water from the plantation well down here to a pond. It's better now that they have the purifier. But they still use this water for cooking. Channeling water has been of the utmost importance to Cambodia since ancient times. Canals around the temples were the backbone of society, providing transport and irrigation. En route to Koh Khe village, I make a stop at Bang Milia Temple. In the 10th century, for a brief time, Koh Khe was the capital of the Khmer Empire. Up to a hundred spectacular temples were built in the area, and they are still being discovered. Abandoned to the jungle, Bang Milia was rarely visited, until an appearance in the Hollywood blockbuster action movie Tomb Raider brought it to the world's attention. The filming left its mark. Bags of sand brought in to level the ground during production in 2000 are still here. Over time, they've burst and spilled, sadly covering the ancient stones. So here you can see the leftover sandbags which weren't removed after the filming of the Tomb Raider film. And here you can see the original ancient stone flooring. It's a shame they haven't removed the sand to bring back the flooring, but that's Cambodia for you. Every tourist did a bit of sweeping. We bring back the original stone, look at that. Uncovering ancient ruins, the makeshift brush. I feel like Indiana Jones. A stone's throw away from this extraordinary temple is the sparse village I'm heading for. Less than 13% of Cambodians in rural areas are connected to the national electricity network. A lot of cooking is done over wood fires, and wood fires also provide light. Wood is a fast diminishing resource in Cambodia, and 84% of Cambodians rely on wood fuel as their main energy source. With a rising population and rising demand for power, there's no way that the trees can grow fast enough to keep up. Energy demand is expected to increase 500% by 2025. The country desperately needs low-cost, sustainable energy solutions. But this one village has a more immediate problem. So I've just been driving around the temple area and apparently this village right behind the temple has problems with this water supply. So I'm here to meet the village chief and talk to him about the issues. So what kinds of problems do you face here? Uh, 
บาทนงขนมปูกวาเก้เมียนปูนบ่าปันเตปราปราบานครุบกระนเมียนเตนงมุยเลยบ่าเมียนเตนงนี่มุยอังกายอีกทัวอ้อยมุยเลยนงใบนกคางมูลทิคางแคดกี่มาทัวอ้อยปีบานนะปันเตดอปีนงประมาณมันเอาตะปนเตบานงนี่ตะปนเตดอมเป็นใบดอมปัวอังกาเอกเนบานอ้อยปราปราใบนี่ทัวบานอ้อยดองหกธรรมดาก็เดี๋ยวข้าตึกไหนเราจะพูดถึงความสุขแล้วจากทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้งหมดของที่ทั้ But without assistance, this community can't afford the initial setup. Ma, the P, the Chia Borat, young, big fat, Thakika, do the, the tray, the jungka, we add, mean Thakika, the the ban day, the chat, the chinol, the tao ban, ku ban, the bay tao ban, the tray, the jungka ban hop. My next and final stop is Siem Reap, Cambodia's second largest city after the capital Phnom Penh. Weeks ago, I planned a trip up to Cambodia to deliver a biofuel converter created in Singapore to help with their power needs. And now that mission is about to be fulfilled. Every year, two million people visit Siem Reap to see the world-famous heritage site Angkor Wat, built in the 9th century. In the ancient capital of Angkor, the ruling Khmer kings built a complex system of canals. They were used to transport materials to build the temples themselves. But most importantly, they were also used as water reservoirs that irrigated the crops. This powerful empire collapsed in the 15th century. The exact cause is unknown, but historical experts consider deforestation a factor. Soil erosion and silting up of the waterways left the people here without their most precious resource. And they became reliant on neighboring countries for their survival. Under current rates of deforestation, this could well happen all over again in as little as 15 years, unless an alternative to wood fuel is found. For my grand arrival at the orphanage, I decide to get my car cleaned. It's the first wash it's had since driving in from Thailand. And about time. My name's Sean. Hello. While I'm waiting, I chat with the owner about why I'm here in Siem Reap. He tells me that there's a biogas facility in the city. Curiosity gets the better of me, so I arrange to pop in to see what their setup is. Here in Cambodia, you get about eight guys washing it down, and about ten girls cleaning the interiors and polishing. Now that's value for money. <laughs> So this biogas facility I'm going to harnesses energy by heating plant material and converts it to electricity. I'm very interested to find out what they use as biomass. The plant's manager has Hi. kindly offered to show me around Hi. with the nice help of a Sean. translator. Uh, Sean, nice to meet you. Sadly, the electricity is being made from trees cut down from the forest. There are many better alternatives. Even rubbish or animal manure can be used to make biogas. Thankfully, the UN and the Cambodian government are working together to develop sustainable biofuel options. So here, the wood is burned in a chamber which traps the steam. 
and I got more of a feeling for the power of this machine than I was hoping for. So, we put the wood in there, it creates all this steam, and then what happens next? What's this? The gas uh, that go from the, the filter, go to the nano filter. Okay, and then yeah, goes and then to the... Go, go to the generator. To create the electricity. Yeah. Okay. This biogas plant isn't a textbook example of health and safety, or environmental awareness. I understand that desperate times call for desperate measures. However, the logging that's happening to provide wood for this plant is just adding to Cambodia's problems. They need to be using waste biomass materials such as rice husk or municipal waste and not cutting down more trees. After 2,500 kilometers on the road, I'm only moments away from sunrise to deliver the converter. I just hope that it's of use to them because it was a long, long journey. At last, my eco mission from Singapore ends here at the Sunrise Children's Village with the delivery of the biofuel converter. Okay. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Good to finally yeah. meet yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Sunrise Children's Village was started 30 years ago to help refugee children from Cambodia's civil war and cross-border conflicts. Today, the orphanage houses up to 60 children who've been abandoned, orphaned, or trafficked like this little boy. And you haven't been able to find his parents? That, exactly, okay. yeah. So that so, is the only story that we know because right. uh, he is uh, only eight months old and no any identity uh, where we can find their, their parents. They cannot find my family, and then the police bring me here. My father, Died and when I was young, and my mother have to to work, just sell a uh, sweet, and so but uh, not enough for me to support. The primary goal of the orphanage is to help the children improve their life through education. About 25% of Cambodia's population is illiterate. Rather than sending the children from the orphanage to government-funded schools, Sunrise opts to raise cash to send them to private institutions. Each year, this costs roughly 55,000 US dollars, a sum they struggle to come up with. So I don't see many yeah. children around. Yeah, actually our children are going to school in the morning. And uh, yeah, yeah they're, they're here. Yeah, and over there, uh, we have the, the cook over there. Uh, all, all the children can get a clean water from see. here also. Okay. Yeah. So all the water coming from the government supplies has that to be correct. cleaned? That correct. Here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this is a water cooler. So I can say unlimited water, uh, cold water. Right. So we don't need to buy water outside. Is this unusual for a village or a school? Uh, I can say this is only from, for here only. Okay. Maybe for only for here. Really? So yeah. other schools would not have this? I think oh, so. Okay. Yes. Sunrise has another water problem though that isn't solved. Every year they suffer badly from terrible floods. Last year's was especially bad. That is uh, uh, the levels of water. Uh, oh, these from are the floodlines? Here. Yes, these are floodlines. And wow. uh, uh, compared to me, you know, it's uh, about up to here. It's yes. crazy. So this is yes. the year before? Yeah, the year before and uh, last year. They have a generator that they use when the erratic government power supply fails or is cut off. But more importantly, the generator powers water pumps that remove water from the compound whenever there's a flood. The electricity supplied by the government simply isn't substantial enough to power the water pumps. The last flood cost them the thousand US dollars just to buy diesel. If they can use biodiesel made from their own waste cooking oil, the money saved can be used to provide education instead. This is my moment, introducing the community to their own biodiesel production facility. 
There it is. <laughs> da, 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 da. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to take you through the steps uh -huh. to convert the waste cooking oil. Yeah. So this is an air pump yep. to aerate the process. This is to heat up the oil. Oh, okay, okay, so make sure those two things are plugged in. Yep. And then before we put this in, we have yep. to strain the oil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right, so we can put that down. Leave that away. A little bit. Yeah. Mm. Don't worry, all the steps are here for you to follow later on, in case I'm not explaining it properly. <laughs> <laughs> then we put in some flakes of sodium hydroxide. Now this stuff can irritate your skin, so put on a glove. A glove. Yeah. And we basically just put the flakes in here slowly by hand. And then we need to put 5.4 liters of methanol, okay. which is this, yeah. okay? Yeah. Make sure that it's set to 70 degrees. 70, yep. Start. Mm -hmm. So let's check the timer. Yep, it's finished. So what we're going to do now is take, hopefully, the converted biodiesel and pour it into this uh, jerry can here. So, OK, let's open the jerry can like this. Funnel in. Who's gonna hold this? Yeah. Who's gonna hold it? Yeah. Okay. It's gonna be heavy. <laughs> then, uh, yeah. You can see how it's a lot thinner yeah. than the oil that went in. Okay. I hope, in my own small way, that I am inspiring yeah. these students to think outside the box about energy production. It will be their generation that will have to continue solving these problems. Yeah, and any problems with the converter, let me know. Okay, it should yeah, be fine. Thank you, okay. okay. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye bye. It's been a tremendous experience going from Singapore to Malaysia to Thailand and finally ending up here in Cambodia to see how sustainable energy and living works in Southeast Asia. I've seen and learned so much. There's no doubt that we will be forced to change our habits as the world's supply of fossil fuel disappears. And no doubt that our current habits are damaging the environment. Hopefully we can learn from the mistakes of the past and have a cleaner, greener, brighter future. Do you like my car? You don't like it? Oh dear. <laughs> oh, kids, that was amazing. Thank you.